when you look at charities, philanthropies, uh, especially the charities, I would say, uh, there are some small charities, in mid sized charity, and there are those Susan and Michael Dell Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. On one side, you have somebody working two jobs, three jobs to keep their life on, keep their lights on, and another job to keep their lights on into their own charities. So our vision evolved from being a fee-free crowdfunding platform to become a fundraising infrastructure company on the cloud for charities and philanthropists. India has close to 3.3 million approximately charities. But when you go to NGO Darpan, government's repository, Niti Aayog's repository of charities, you'll be surprised to find only 200,000 charities. Uh, 30 lakh, 33 lakhs to uh, just around 2 lakh charities are registered there. The same go to income tax department portal, you will see only around 2 lakhs, 2 and a half lakhs maybe charities. So think about the number of charities you have in India versus how many are actually visible to people. Surprisingly, they are not even visible. We were surprised to see less than 5% charities have a website. Now in today's age and time, especially think post COVID world, when we are living in the digital world, they do not even have a website. So this is the one of the major problems which I feel in which they need a digital identity. Hi, welcome to the Mohua Show. My name is Mohua Chinappa and I am an author, entrepreneur and ex-housewife. This podcast is about everything from business to technology to arts to lifestyle, but done and spoken, Imandari se. Hi, in today's episode, please be inspired as we welcome Chet Jain, a visionary philanthropy entrepreneur and one of the early promisers of the Living My Promise movement, which we're going to learn from him a lot more now. Chet is the driving force behind CrowdEra, a groundbreaking platform revolutionizing how charities and nonprofits raise funds for over 10 years now. With years of experience crafting innovative fundraising models, he's redefining impact, financial inclusion and sustainability in the nonprofit sector. But Chet's ambitions reach far beyond an entrepreneurship. He's spearheading a paradigm shift in the global giving economy, championing the mindset transition from giving back to giving first, which is such a wonderful line. This isn't just a catchphrase, it's a call to action that's reshaping how we approach philanthropy and we'll understand a lot more from him. Chet has been a bootstrapped entrepreneur and he's not only built a thriving business, but also emerged as a beacon of social good. His journey is a testament to the power of purpose-driven leadership and the transformative potential of technology in solving global challenges. So welcome, Chet, in today's episode. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm honored to be here and thanks for the wonderful kind words. I think that was a wonderful introduction. Oh, yeah. There's so much more about you that, uh, you know, I, I think this was a very short one, uh, you know, for all our listeners. But now the first question that comes to me, Chet, is this, that what inspired you to embark on your entrepreneurial journey? You will not be very happy to uh, hear this answer, but honestly speaking, as any young guy would do. So I started my first company when I was in uh, my teens, literally age 19. And uh, the only motivation at that moment uh, is generally money. It's about money, fame, whatever you think of. So there was no special reason for me to jump into entrepreneurship. And somehow it just ended up becoming a habit. So honestly, the journey uh, from zero to 160 people uh, was a six year journey for me with a bunch of uh, companies in between lots of smaller failures and successes in between but the real journey began after a major failure like i had a very nice zero to 160 people uh, people peak in multiple ventures and from 160 to zero it took me six months so six years of growth and six months of decline and that was something that made me realize what is that i did wrong what happened but there was a beautiful perspective at that time uh, I just heard from my mom and I just retained to it. She just told me, there is something that nobody can take away from you. And she's like, finish your engineering. That was a very trigger driven line. And I was like, okay, mom, I'll do that. So I took a sabbatical around that period. So this entrepreneurship somewhere got lost until it was revived again ages later. How wonderful. So what was that pivotal moment, you know, that led you to take the leap in the impact space? Was there any personal journey that uh, made you go there? Oh, interestingly, when uh, this happened, when I, my first venture, a bunch of first ventures, uh, what I did went down uh, and 
I realized there was something that was holding me back when I started. The motivation was altogether different. I still hadn't found my purpose yet. But those statements that my mom told me, I still recollect. I was like, nobody can take away your education from you. So it always stayed with me. And with that in mind, it was a small event uh, uh, in Silicon Valley. I was in Silicon Valley for over a decade. Uh, there was uh, a nice temple drive where a friend of mine was collecting $5 a day. A very dear friend of mine, Kamlesh Bhai, I respect him a lot. He was like, um, you know, why don't you uh, also subscribe to this $5 a day so that we can do the temple development stuff? And I was like, why are you doing this? There are so many rich people around me. Just turn around and... I pointed at a few uh, good uh, senior people that we all respect and like they would give you whatever you need. If you are actually doing something right for someone, then you should do that. It has to be a peer to peer relationship. If you want to take my money, then tell me where it is going to what kind of people, etc. And he uh, gave me a very nice answer. He said uh, in a typical Indian language, you know, and that was like amazing line. That just triggered something in me. And I was like, what am I really doing? Seriously, except for sending a little bit of money for some underprivileged uh, kids on and off for education, because education was always there. So that was a trigger that kind of uh, made me realize I need to do something right. It was just right then. I stopped what I was doing. I had an entrepreneurial venture, something going on. It was a very interesting thing that I was doing. And typical Silicon Valley, all, all was about more of a uh, tech driven uh, activity that I was planning to do. But with this trigger in mind, I ended up starting my first company, uh, which was called Fundidio. It was an education fundraising platform, creating educational micro loans. And that was the trigger that kind of, that just one small sentence by somebody saying, what are you doing? Don't talk about what we are doing. Just tell me what you are doing. And then that triggered me to launch something very interesting. How that amazing, Jed, because I totally relate to it, you know, because that's something that both Baba and Ma have always said that to me. I, you know, I grew up in a very aspirational middle class home and uh, my father and mother always insisted, um, not that they were, they did a lot of uh, parenting things that were not exactly right. But there's one thing that stayed back with me was this, that read and, uh, you know, study, because that's something that nobody can take away from you. So thank you for sharing such an, uh, you know, perspective, because it really helps so many of our listeners, you know, in this. So tell me a little bit about your vision when you started Crowd Era, you know, and how has it evolved over the years? That'd be wonderful because, you know, so many um, of my listeners probably will want to start something in the space of philanthropy and charity. And, you know, we are also going to get down to understanding the difference between the two. But before that, tell me about Crowd Era. Oh, wow. That's an interesting journey. So life in Silicon Valley, uh, first company had started, uh, things were doing okay. Well, I had my own peaks and valleys as well. There was a time, uh, there was a time during my first venture, I am sitting in my car and uh, literally in tears, figuring out how am I going to pay uh, the salary next month to my people? Because running a philanthropic venture is not easy. You not don't necessarily make a lot of money. And then you have a lot of challenges sometimes you face. We had a challenge. We had an acquisition offer. We declined. And somehow a uh, major supporter backed out during that period. So it was it was a major hit to me. But just at that moment, one of my dear friends and a mentor at that time called me. I was sitting in my car. And he said, where are you sitting? I said, I'm here. Uh, I told where I was. I was in Menlo Park where I was living. But I said, he said, where are you? I said, I'm sitting in my car. He said, which car? And I said, uh, I'm in the car that I drive. I said, okay, so just look at what you drive, where you're living. And uh, look at the perspective. What you're trying to build is on the philanthropic side. But how you're living this life is different. So this valley was not built by the accidental uh, successes or the, you know, 1% successes like uh, Mark Zuckerberg, right? This was built by a lot of normal people like you and I, who struggle, who strive, who work hard, who give their decades to build something. So you have built something and you're trying to build something new. And that was a beautiful trigger that uh, reminded me of staying focused on what I want to do. There was another trigger around the same time. We were flying from Austin back to Bay Area and a friend of mine was sitting next to me and he told me that what you're building, and we were of course talking about our journeys, what's going on. He said, what you're building 
is not something that uh, today's age kids build to build an app and sell something. You're trying to build a vision that could last for 30 years, 40 years, maybe 100 years. You don't know about it. We had ended up becoming, after all the setbacks and some successes, some setbacks, we had ended up becoming a regular crowdfunding platform, which was for education, of course, which was charging a fee. And that was hurting me because I still recollect there was a lady, wonderful uh, lady, who initially worked with us during the education fundraising space. Uh, her name was Laura Sims. And she had raised money for uh, post-Haiti earthquakes. Uh, she has raised money for the girls to do education because we only supported education. Uh, she said, you know, the money that we used was not used for education. It was used for something else. And then she gave us a reason that it was for the solar lamps so that the girls, of course, they would use it for education or studying. But they would walk with those lamps back their home in the night, pitch dark. And that lamps used to save them from getting picked up and getting raped. And she said the commissions that you took could have saved X amount of girls because we would have made X amount of number of lamps. And that was the trigger that just hit me. I was like, we need to do something else. You know, uh, Almighty gave me an opportunity to exit from the company and it was always there in my mind. You're like, let us do something. Well, let's make fundraising a fundamental right of a human being. Can we make fee-free fundraising a fundamental right? So that was the original trigger that started uh, Crowdera as an organization. So we started like a first, originally as a first free crowdfunding platform in the US. Uh, but where it evolved was a very interesting journey because that gave us an exposure. Now, not just doing education, we are also trying to support many other organizations. Now, supporting many other organizations, you talk to them, right? You hear their problems. What we realized, yes, we solved a very important problem by giving a fee-free fundraising platform, a crowdfunding platform, but they have so many other problems. And a lot of those problems were very strategic in nature. So we decided to dedicate our energies, life, to solving one problem at a time and figuring out is there something really core to them that we could solve. And see how we can make their life better. Life of those people who give, you know, when you look at charities, philanthropies, uh, especially the charities, I would say, uh, there are some small charities in mid sized charity, and there are those Susan and Michael Dell Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. On one side, you have somebody working two jobs, three jobs to keep their life on, keep their lights on, and another job to keep their lights on into their own charities. So, our Vision evolved from being a fee-free crowdfunding platform to become a fundraising infrastructure company on the cloud for charities and philanthropists. So I'm, I'm trying to keep my answer short because this journey is so big that I could go on for. <laughs> oh, it's amazing, I mean, you know, So I'm so moved when I hear about the lamps and you know for the girls uh, to walk back home. I mean, being a mother myself, I. I, you know, I mean, uh, trust me, the kind of stories we have heard, uh, and uh, you know, I, I do not have courage to go on the ground and do hard work. Honestly speaking, everyone has their own challenges, right? Yes. I cannot go on the grassroots uh, and work, but when somebody is doing that, we like whatever we can do for them, whatever in whatever capacity we should do. So I am the guy who can sit behind the computer, think, strategize, build something, and enable the ecosystem, uh, but. Hats off to those people who really uh, do an amazing job on the ground. Yeah, that's a very difficult one because you're invested in it emotionally. And yeah. uh, that can be a very difficult entanglement, you know, uh, to untangle yourself from that and right. uh, take it forward is a very, very tough work. So, you know, just for our listeners, I think, uh, you know, Chetil, it would be wonderful to know how do you distinguish between charity and philanthropy? And why do you think it's important for people to understand uh, the difference? Yeah, I just mentioned the word charity and philanthropy. I know that. Uh, and I, I have been a strong proponent of understanding what kind of organization you are. Let me just give you an example. There is a major flood happening, right? And the first thing first that we think about is, oh my God, the flood has happened, a lot of disaster and all the disaster recovery, recovery efforts are going on. Now, during this disaster recovery efforts, uh, the first thing first is to ensure we need to quickly rescue people, rehabilitate people, give them food, shelter, whatever we can, depending on where it is. This is all charity. Charity is always reactive. Damage has happened. Now we are trying to fix that damage. We are trying to solve that problem some other way. That's charity. It's a reactive function. Now, when you think of the same perspective that, hey, this is the village where every time 
there would be a flood. Can we think of building a wall around the village? Can we build strong drainage around the, uh, the village or the city? So, and can we build a nice proactive system in place where in case if something happens, we will be ready. So anything that we do proactively to solve the problem for good, to uproot the problem, right? Is philanthropy. For example, what Bill Gates did for polio was philanthropy, was uprooting uh, polio from the roots, right? I mean, getting rid of polio from India. Now, versus starting a hospital for um, people who are facing that is more like a charity. So that's the primary difference between charity and philanthropy. And why it is important for people to know is because, think about it, right? I am not the person who would watch an ad where I'm seeing a crying baby or a you know, dying patient online, it just moves me badly. I can't really see it. I am an emotional person and it would hurt me. So maybe accidentally once I may donate, but I may first shut it down or switch off those ads. I want to see happiness. I want to see the happy face of the same person. So I may not be the person who may be moved by charity. But as a human being, when I see somebody trying to do something interesting, uh, for a major cause, like somebody trying to do research on how to make prosthetic limbs affordable for people, the result may not be right then, then and there. It may take five years, 10 years, two years, one year, whatever. I may be contributing to that. I will feel like this is something important uh, and I may do that. So knowing what kind of your donors you have, it could, and every donor has a persona. Think about whether it is a corporation, whether it is an HNI, whether it is an individual small retail donor, everyone has a persona. Knowing the person of your donor is very important. If the person is moved by charitable causes, then they will donate to charitable causes. So uh, pitching, you know, a proactive environmental safety uh, project to charitable donors may not fetch anything. And vice versa, pitching a medical emergency to people who talk about environment may not necessarily make sense. I'm, I'm just generalizing it, but um, typically that's how uh, it works. So that's why it's very important for somebody to know what is a charity versus a philanthropy and what is the difference between a donor persona, whether the donor will donate to a charitable cause or a philanthropic cause. I'm not saying that they may not donate to everything, but uh, knowing it is very important for a philanthropic or a charitable organization who's trying to raise funds. Thank you so much. That was uh, fantastic, I think, you know, for us to understand. So let's just talk a little bit about Crowd Era, which has developed very innovative fundraising strategies, you know, and you have successfully applied them for nonprofits, uh, films, and even spiritual organizations. So can you share some, uh, you know, models that you've worked on and how they can be replicated by others who also wish to do this? Uh, it's an interesting journey. Again, uh, like you said, yes, we started with a free crowdfunding platform. And we, to be honest, one of the most prestigious uh, campaigns that we did was with Dr. Sunita Krishnan. Uh, Sunita and I met in the U.S. Uh, earlier. I think we met before, after uh, we did the campaign. And we, with the crowdfunding, we helped uh, her build, I think it was Indian currency, two and a half, three crores, approximately three crores. To, she was shifting from her Hyderabad base to the ashram because there was a lot of pressure on her in the city. And what an amazing work she does. Oh my God. I was absolutely moved. And she explained as the cause that what you was, she was trying to do. So that small crowdfunding campaign of a small three crores uh, helped her build a rescue and rehabilitation, a rescue center rather. So when the victims, sex traffic victims are rescued, so they, they are given a certain time to stay in that shelter for some time so that they can settle down and understand what's going on. And then they can, uh, you know, be assimilated into the ashram. So that period for them to settle down and understand that that small center was such a powerful thing and so many lives were changed. This story connected with many of my friends. One of those friends was uh, Mr. Rajat Kapoor, filmmaker. Uh, I and Rajat happened to have discussion about a few things. And there was this one day I get a call from Rajat and he says, Hey, whatever you do for this charity system, do you think we can do it for creative world? and uh, for films and i was like why not uh it's fundraising is a process if the process is followed why not and that was and of course i am a big fan of rajat i love rajat personally i had seen all his movies and this was an opportunity for me with working with rajat to figure it out so we did our first film fundraising uh campaign and rkrk was made uh just 2022 rkrk was released 
um, in PVR and I was at the premiere and Rajat said, we made it happen. So that was one journey and that started the trigger of multiple film fundraising campaigns. One of many of the films went to, you know, there was a Marathi film fair given to one of the films or I think many awards. So Ria did a wonderful, Ria Mukherjee did a wonderful film, uh, this guy's. Then, so I don't recollect all the films, so films, music, music. So that was a creative space. Then, uh, one of the researches that we were doing, which I already originally mentioned that we were trying to solve the problems. One of the problems that we were trying to solve was how to uh, figure out the strategic uh, shift in the charities. What could the ch ch charities do that large charities are able to do, large foundations are able to. And what we realized was we were talking about religious and political organizations being very successful versus the small and medium charities. And that was something we realized we could productize. We could solve that problem. So we solved that problem with a product. While we solved that prog problem with a product by productizing fundraiser outreach, we would realize, we realized why not work with uh, the spiritual organizations who are actually doing something, some good work. So we ended up working with Chin Mission and ISKCON. And Sri Badrika Ashram in multiple ways. They're using, they're one of our most happy customers. We love them. And uh, these spiritual organizations are actually building libraries. Uh, Somebody is uh, building scholarship funds. A lot of wonderful work they do. And while we got inspired from the spiritual organization, religious organization, we built the product. We were like, it was time for us to actually uh, help these spiritual organizations to fundraise. So we helped them. And this evolved to work with uh, international NGOs. Uh, we work with Habitat, we work with MSF. And with each different set of organizations, our fundraising infrastructure evolved from a simple crowdfunding platform to an infrastructure company. The journey was, uh, you know, simply beautiful, uh, I would say. So did I answer you? Did I answer your question? Because yes, I guess you did. have your question had two parts. I hope <laughs> I answered both. Did. You did absolutely. Well, you did as uh, I mean you're you're a fantastic speaker, Jet. So it's it's lovely. So can you just share your perspective on the current state of India's NGOs and charities and why digital financial inclusion is uh, you know crucial for their future because the world is turning digital and uh, how do they need to imbibe all of these changes? I think you have done wonderful research about us. Uh, so thank you for that. State of Indian Charities, I think I, what moved me to focus on Indian Charities uh, years ago was the stats when I noticed. So India has close to 3.3 uh, 3 million approximately charities. Of course, it includes some schools as well. So the charities that we talk in India, 3.3 3 million, should ideally be registered somewhere. And I'm sure they are registered with uh, charity commission boards, etc., etc. But when you go to NGO Darpan, government's repository, Niti Aayog's repository of charities, you'll be surprised to find only 200,000 charities. Uh, 30 lakh, 33 lakhs to uh, just around 2 lakh charities are registered there. The same go to income tax department portal, you will see only around 2 lakhs, 2 and a half lakhs maybe charities. So think about the number of charities you have in India versus how many are actually visible to people. Surprisingly, they are not even visible. They are only on those lists. When you do a deep dive research, we did a thorough research in uh, uh, the NGO Darpan's list, and we were surprised to see less than 5% charities have a website. Now, in today's age and time, especially think post-COVID world, when we are living in the digital world, they do not even have a website. How are we going to, everyone has a, how are, everyone has a, you know, uh, Google Pay right now, UPI right now. Yes. But you do not even have a website to reach people. So this is the, one of the major problems which I feel in it, they need a digital identity. Now, with the digital identity, our initial goal was financial inclusion. World Bank talks about financial inclusion, but our goal was, that's, uh, that's a humanitarian financial inclusion. Our goal was B2B financial inclusion. So when, he, when I say B2B financial inclusion is, we want to touch a billion lives, right? We can't really go to every human and help uh, as a framework driven organization. If we help one organization in our lifetime, so in, uh, if we help one organization in its own lifetime, the organization could potentially touch a million lives. So how do we, uh, you know, maybe thousand lives, right? How do we touch a billion lives would be if we are able to help a million institutions, we'll be able to do that. So we were like, let's do financial inclusion for, uh, you know, small charities. So, but then we realized without digital identity, it's not going to help. So that's when we came up with the thought process of digital financial inclusion 
for Indian charities. And the idea was each of these institutions first need digital identity, then they need awareness, then they certainly need financial inclusion, which essentially means access to fundraising tools, payment tools, etc., etc. So it is absolutely eminent for Indian charities to go digital. But I think the first thing first, what we need to do, all of us, is uh, spread awareness about it. Because rural charities, we work with one of the rural organizations uh, in Chennai, in, in uh, Tamil Nadu. We ended up communicating with around 500 plus organizations. And we realized 200 of them really wanted to do something. But seriously speaking, without having a digital identity, life for them was difficult. I mean, of course, uh, that's why we have a certain vision that we are working on. But as a, as a for-profit organization, our hands are always tied uh, when we are trying to work with small and medium organizations. I hope so, that answers your question. Yes, Crowding is almost 10 years old now. So tell us what is the, you know, the next things that you have in the pipeline? Oh, interesting. Uh, interestingly, 10 years, like, a uh, just flew by, uh, in no time. I still remember the first day when we, when I was very inspired by Andrew NG's Coursera, I happened to meet him at a small event where I was giving a talk about my previous company and, uh, the education platform, uh, in 2013. And he was talking about Coursera and he said, I'm changing the world with the one course at a time, the power of courses, changing the era with courses. And that small brief conversation where, uh, when I was, uh, before I was speaking that brief conversation, he said power of crowd and changing the era. And I was like, wow, that's a trigger. We can change the era with power of crowd. That's how crowd era came up. So that from that day to when we started and today, uh, we have evolved a lot. Uh, and, uh, what we realize is we have to, we have to look back in the 10 years. So we are coming up with something called as decade of impact. In 2025 will be our year, uh, where we will be celebrating a decade of impact. And in this year, we will be working with every month. We will be celebrating, uh, with one of our charity partners and somebody who has really make an, made an impact, not about how much they have raised, but what kind of impact they have made. So we'll be choosing one charity every month. Uh, next year and celebrating with them and helping them. We will be investing our time, energy, efforts, uh, capital, whatever is required to amplify their impact. The mission would be amplified with the uh, crowd era. So that's a decade of impact that we want to do for next year, at least that we know. And the second thing that we have uh, really thought about and we have started doing already. So I gave up my executive responsibilities last year when Dr. Rajan uh, Samuel joined uh, Crowdera as CEO and took over the reins. And I'm, I'm more like the chief evangelist right now. You can still call me the CEO, chief evangel evangelizing officer. Rather. So the journey from now onwards would be to find the right leaders uh, to join us. I mean, this is a call to action, right? This is where your listeners, some amazing leaders who want to come out of the corporate world and join us. Uh, we really want to welcome them. So uh, finding right leadership to doc, uh, join Dr. Regen, join our, uh, Dr. Rajan, join a board to take this impact to, you know, take us to the million institutions that we really want to go to. So that Wonderful. after the decade. So there's a silent philanthropist in you, right? So tell us a little bit more about the pledge to living uh -huh. my promise. I'm dying to know about that. What does this foundation do? So, uh, Living my promise, uh, I mean, I love and uh, I'm thoroughly inspired by an amazing gentleman who founded, originally founded Give India, uh, Venkat. And Venkat also founded, uh, with a couple of other people, founded this uh, organization called Living My Promise. This organization's very simple mission was for people to pledge 50%, very clear, 50% of their wealth to you know, a charitable cause. It could be during their lifetime or after they pass on in uh, from this world. So it's kind of trying to build a legacy. And people, what do we all need? Like, to be honest, uh, it's about the need and wants in the life. So it was all about beyond your needs and wants are met. What can you do with what you have, what you leave on, right? What do you, what do your children uh, really want? So I was really inspired when I was approached uh, by Girish. Girish Patra is an amazing guy who is one of the first promisers with uh, Venkat. And 
I instantly decided that, to be honest, I started all of this with the same journey. I mean, I was questioned why philanthropic approach, because this is not even an industry. It just moved me. And I was like, I have to do this thing. Of course, I pledged for everything, whatever I would have when I pass on, would 50% would go to impact. My son was like, I really don't mind whatever you do with what you have and whatever you build. So I pledged 50% of my new wealth, whatever would I be building. And during my lifetime, whatever I can do, I'll continue doing it via my foundation and uh, through other charitable organization. And of course, uh, investing time and energy of all these years was my personal giving to uh, uh, yeah, uh, to the philanthropic causes. And shout out for living my promise. I think to everyone out there who feels they would have beyond their needs and wants, if they are left with something, if they really want to do something, they should pledge. Uh, slightly contradicting, contradicting to what I generally say, but I think make this intention of giving and see how it changes your life. Absolutely agree with you on this, Chet. There is no greater joy than to be able to give. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think any any material, uh, you know, possession can give you the kind of joy that you have when you see the smile on someone's face. So, uh, you know, really needed something. So, I yeah, I, I agree with you. So tell me a little bit about the Giving Economy Awards that you started. You know, what motivated you to start that? So, 2016, I was uh, invited to attend a beautiful summit at UN General Assembly. Uh, interestingly, it was also on my birthday. And uh, I was there meeting some amazing people, right from the billionaires to uh, philanthropists, some amazing people, people who would criticize uh, charities and who would uh, embrace charities, people who have done some amazing uh, work, like Leslie Woodwin, I heard about her work. I was, I was amazed. Uh, I met Naveen, who was doing some amazing work, Naveen Jain, uh, who was doing some amazing work through biotech. I, Kunal was an inspiration, Kunal Sun, who was uh, the creator of Nova's uh, summit that was. And the interesting thing was I got exposed to SDGs for the first time, UN SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there were MDGs before, there were SDGs before. And I realized living in Silicon Valley, uh, coming to India very often, I realized India doesn't know anything. Asia doesn't know much about this thing. There are efforts, but very minuscule at a governmental level. People don't talk about it. That also made me realize that people do not talk about even their own good work. There are silent philanthropists. There are silent uh, givers. People don't talk about their best practices. How do we bring this, you know, giving that people have in themselves who they have been giving? How do we identify those best practices? Can we create frameworks around it? And can we bring it to the world? So with that in mind, I was like, I need to do something. It was, I was already in India. It was 2018. So we started our first uh, uh, small setup uh, in BKC, uh, a small event. We called it Giving Economy Awards. And the idea was to identify some wonderful people, see if we can give them the voice to speak about their best practices and take that voice, spread it around uh, to a lot of wonderful other people, uh, other wonderful people who can learn from their, their best practices and start doing some good work. So with that in mind, a small Giving Economy Awards that started in 2018 uh, has now become a beautiful Giving Economy Forum that uh, brings wonderful change makers from all over the world. We had nominations from over 100 countries, uh, awardees from over seven countries, uh, 300 plus change makers. I, I think 250 plus change makers, rather, my bad. Uh, have uh, been conferred with Giving Economy Awards for all different wonderful work they have done for different sustainable uh, development goals uh, that they have aligned. And the mission evolved that let us build a forum, uh, World Econ just, just like World Economic Forum. Uh, of course, we are 50 years late for that. Like World Economic Forum, a lot of uh, private jets go and talk there and they talk about... Uh, how they can change the climate, how they can change the Eastern world. I was like, it's time for people from the African nations, people from Asian nations, people from the global South to have their voice because people are talking about them uh, in Daos, right? 
why can't people talk about themselves giving them their own voice and that's how giving economy forum was formed and now these 250 plus 300 people are trying to talk about their own problems their own challenges their own solutions and that's that's the mission we want to continue and some day we would have maybe giving economy forum some day would recommend to the un saying hey the next version of sustainable development goals should come come from the east and africa so yeah that's that's brief about the giving economy forum and the giving economy awards wonderful for someone who's we welcome you and we welcome you to uh, the next version of giving economy uh, forums uh, event at kuala lumpur on december 3rd and see all wonderful meet all wonderful new awardees that we are going to have oh wonderful i will come i will come chat i will uh, thank so you, you so much and thank i i'll send you, i'll have that formal invitation sent to you uh, thank you so much so much so for someone who's just starting their journey you know uh, whether in entrepreneurship or philanthropy what's that single most important piece of advice that you would give them oh mm, i would say for entrepreneurs uh, first thing first i always uh, you know tell people that the early entrepreneurs especially uh, the young kids right uh, first time entrepreneurs always ensure that your bread and butter is not sacrificed because if you really do not uh, have the runway for next 3 years of survival because you can't build a right enterprise right company uh, in i mean of course there are uh, there are uh, exceptions but you need to dedicate at least 3 to 4 years to see what you want to see what you want to build so i always recommend people to ensure you know elevate themselves from depletion do not get depleted because depleted cannot be elevated there are exceptions in the world of course but i always believe if you are going to get depleted have your reserve first that's a very basic level advice and then the second piece of advice is do not try to build something to sell right away i mean it's not wrong but look at a 10 year vision whatever you're going to build can you see something that can last for 10 years 20 years 30 years you may not have a plan uh, you may evolve you may start with something today and you may be altogether different 5 years down the line but have that vision in mind that whatever you are going to do whether you are a philanthropist you are getting into philanthropy or your charity or your uh, a regular startup right have that plan have that vision for 10 years 20 years 30 years versus just thinking about what are you going to pitch to the investors in next 3 months i know it's a very uh, uh, you know contradicting advice but i think that's what i feel uh, from my personal journey thank you so much for taking out the time today chet for being on the show it has been an absolute honor for me to have on this podcast we wish you lots and lots of luck and uh, thank you for taking out the time today thank you so much mova it was lovely and uh, you know greetings to all your audience and especially as a uh, token of gratitude for all your audience if any of your audience would like to work with crowder i'm going to pitch to the crowder ceo dr rajan samuel to see if anyone coming in from uh, wanting to launch their charity philanthropy or want some help they should do some crowder should do their uh, best efforts uh, to help them maybe provide discounts or provide guidance through all different programs thank you so much to you our dearest listeners you can find us on your favorite streaming services spotify amazon music apple podcast and of course on all other major streaming services with loads of love we are the mohua show where we talk imandari se